When you speak in a church, it's not uh, the one you shepherd uh, a couple different things. You're able to maybe bring a little bit of different perspective to the word, which is why I like to bring in people to, to preach and teach at the church where I serve. You're also able to say things with clarity that maybe the Spirit has given you, and then you leave. <laughs> so whatever the Lord has for you guys uh, this morning, we're leaving tomorrow. So <laughs> truth of the matter is, we'd love to come back. Uh, Pastor Wes and I met online, just pastors connecting different directions. Does that have a bad connotation here? <laughs> it wasn't on any of those sites. It was on Acts 29. And uh, I remember pulling up Dunbar and saying, wow, like, what's, uh, what's the life of a Christian like in Vancouver? And it's very different. It's different in this day and age. So if you were to come to Texas where my wife, Selena, and I, my wife, Selena, honey, raise your hand. <laughs> my little Latin wife right there. Met her, saw her dance salsa, and knew she must not have been a Christian. <laughs> like, she's way too good of a dancer. She may not know Jesus. And the truth of the matter is, at the time, I did not, and she did. So we have three daughters. If you were to come join us in Texas, you have what we call the Bible Belt, which is the Deep South, which everybody says they're a Christian, or they used to. And then Texas is like the belt buckle of the Bible Belt. So if I were to take you to San Antonio right now, two million plus people, if we were to go into Starbucks, you would see Bible studies happening all over our city. Um, the issue, though, is, is that we have a lot of religious people but not a whole lot of Christ followers. You know, like you have, you have Catholics that are Catholic because their grandparents were Catholic. You have Buddhists that were Buddhists because their grandparents were Buddhists. Well, it's prevalent also in the evangelical church. <clears throat> so what's interesting about the gospel is that one day when we stand in front of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and we hear Jesus' voice, and I'm going to give you a verse today that talks about him singing over us, uh, we're not going to be able to say, well, hey, Lord, I'm here because my parents know you. Well, my grandmother, she was a very godly person. There's no grandkids in heaven. It's only children. And so I'd encourage you today to get your Bible open. Maybe it's an app that you have. Uh, I do predominantly all of my stuff um, through um, my, my, my phone. Maybe it's an iPad. I'm cool with that, too. Um, maybe it's the hard copy Bible, which is really cool. Some of y'all have that. But we're going to be in Revelations today. And here's the challenge I want to give you first. Uh, turn to Mark 12, verse uh, 29. It's a very interesting passage here. Now, here's the challenge I'm going to lay down to you. Uh, being from Vancouver and knowing the Lord and wanting to walk with Him. There is a command. It's the greatest, the com greatest command. And what we will see in this passage is that Jesus links the greatest command that we know with the second one. They, you, can't, you can't separate them. So hear the word of God in this before we go to Revelation, and we'll be in Revelation chapter 1. Mark 12, Jesus says this. Jesus answered, after being asked which command is the most important of all, Jesus answered, the most important is, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one and here it is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. By the way, that's everything. That's your, your whole being. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. Now listen to the second part of verse 31. There is no other command greater than these. He links them. He doesn't say, get the first one down, and number two, if you're, if you're okay, do that one. There is no greater commandment than these. They're one. So as believers, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm way pragmatic in how I look at the Bible now. I think the Bible is phenomenally logical. It's definitely if then, if you do this and this is what happens, if you respond this way, here's, here's the resultant of that work. If we as Christians say that we love God and we don't proactively love our neighbors, we do not love God. The two are one. So we cannot say this is a personal thing between me and God. And God, I love you and I know you love me and not love our neighbors. We can't. And you don't love your neighbors in your mind. You love them in your heart and it comes through your hands. 
and it comes through your feet, and you go to them, and you care for them, the neighbors, you know, the neighbors you like right now, and the neighbors that had that dog that does not, that needs to go see Jesus immediately, okay, <laughs> that just barks, has one little IQ point hanging in his brain, that neighbor, you have to love them. You're people that you work with, that irritate you, that believe different things, you and I are called to love them. Uh, was it Dr. Elliot, Mr. Elliot, who's in, who's in captivity right now? I don't know that man, but I'm thinking right now, oh my gosh. Like he's, he's in prison. How is he called to love those captors? Which is virtually impossible, right? Apart from, apart from Jesus Christ. So Vancouver, if you say you love God, you have to love your neighbor. You have to. And this is where the church that I come from, and maybe the church in Vancouver, we're, we're languishing in this a little bit. We're wanting to put up the walls and close the doors and say, we're here. Let's just make much of this. You actually can't do it. I would add one more thing before we hit Revelation. The gift of mercy and the gift of forgiveness and the gift of uh, talents. I didn't know your pastor could play piano like that. Like, that was impressive. I thought he was going to, like, rock another hand over a second. <laughs> And he can sing, and, and I did, and very, very talented. The gifts that we've been given are gifts to be given to us that we may what? Give them away. So when you, when you receive mercy, you must give mercy. When you, when you receive forgiveness, you must give forgiveness. If you keep these gifts, you are stealing from a holy God because they're gifts to be given away. And that's what we're called to do as a church. Now, if this is our calling, and, and, and my church, where Selena and I go, Mission Church, is working through this now. If the command is no greater than this, to love the Lord your God with everything you are and your neighbor as yourself, that overflow that God gives, the overflow should be to my neighbors, uh, to the people I drink coffee with, to people I work out with, to anywhere and everywhere. There should be love and care. If that's the case, I'm going to give you from Revelation today why it is so easy to give these things away. Because you are loved by a holy God. You are not drugged behind him. He does not force you to be who he has called you to be. He enables you to be way more than you can possibly recognize in and of your own strength. Do you believe that, church? Okay, go to Revelation 1. And we're going to speak of the urgency in which we live. All of our expectations and demand even is that we will live long lives, right? All of us are, especially 20-somethings, 30-somethings in here, you guys know you're going to live at least another 80 to 100 years. So some things will be taken care of in the future. Those of us that are this side of 50, I'll be 52 in May, begin to go, mm, not so much. Knees don't work anymore. Shoulders don't work anymore. Um, tough time sleeping, some anxiety, some worry. Listen, you are not promised tomorrow, and I'm not a doomsday guy. I just, some of us come from countries where we have seen death a lot clearer than other people have seen it. We have, we have seen persecution. We have seen people being snatched from their homes. We understand, and we need to understand this as a whole, that in the body of Christ, maybe in your life economy, you have 20, 30, 40 years left. Maybe tomorrow God's calling me home. I don't know. So there needs to be an urgency as how we receive Scripture. And not to be so flippant. And what I've found, and I, and I have a good amount of education too, so does my wife, so I'm not, I'm just saying with a lot more education, Vancouver is very educated. For me, I see people that are more educated, they become more cynical sometimes. They tend to reason everything. Well, I understand how that works, Tom. I have a master's degree. Let me tell you something. May we as believers adopt the simplicity of a little kid when he's told by his parents that love him and care for him, hey, this is how it is. May we receive that instead of question everything. The word of God is super tight about what it says and who we are. So let me pray. Ask the Lord to bless us. I'm praying. Listen to me. Look at me for a second. I am praying, church, that today, in the name of Jesus Christ, you would be righteously offended. You would, your fur would be rubbed the wrong way. And your response would be, wait, I'm not sure the Bible says that. So then you're going to dig into the word. You're going to get after it yourself, and we're going to become Bereans for one another. Just, just mining from the Bible what it says. Okay, I pray that this year, uh, if you never have, read through the Bible, the whole Bible. Read all the way through it. 
I've done it many, many times, and every year, and I call it the story of God, I, I, I see a deeper comprehension of who God is, and I'm blown away at my ugly sin state. I'm also blown away at just this beauty and perfection and majesty and magnificent and pure strength and holiness of the God that has called us. You know what that's called? It's called being filled up with the Holy Spirit. And what happens is the overflow is our love for our neighbors. So I'm going to give you some reasons today why you should love this God. Revelation 1, 1 through 3. Let me pray real quick. Lord, uh, bless us. I've already been blessed in worship. Band was awesome. Words were awesome. Uh, Lord, to be able to pray with each other and to pray for one another, one of the greatest honors we have that you give us to lift up the body and to lift up one another, to be faithful in that and simple and pray as you prayed, Lord. This book of Revelation, it's a tough one. Uh, we're going to keep it simple today, Almighty God. So I would pray that those who don't know you in the room would be stirred in their spirit by your Holy Spirit. I pray that those that do know you in this room but have gotten to a place where kind of consciously or unconsciously they, they feel like they know pretty much what's going on, uh, invoke something in them right now, Lord. Make your word alive as it is. It is living and breathing, and it cuts down to our soul. Lord, cut us today for the glory of your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Revelation 1, 1 through 3. I'll read three verses. We'll talk about it. And I'll have two other passages and some cross-references for you. I love the word, by the way. Okay, We're going to be in Scripture a lot. I hope you do too. Revelation 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. This is actual. This is literal. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. We'll find out later that that, that that angel of God is actually Jesus himself. Verse 2, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. Verse 3, and listen to this. We, we have to take the word for what it says. There is prescriptive scripture and descriptive scripture. When, when we read in the Old Testament that David put a rock in a sling and killed Goliath, that does not mean if big people bother you, you should stone them, Right? Can we agree on that? Yes, it doesn't mean that, okay? Um, that, would be a, that would be describing a situation. The prescription of that is different. But here's what he says in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. This is John of the New Testament. This is one of Jesus' top three, along James and Peter. They were the top three tier disciples that Jesus kind of is inner circle. Uh, John testified in his gospel in his three letters that Jesus was the Christ, the God-man. Super clear about this. At this time, they've already tried to boil him. They have boiled him in oil. So imagine what he looks like. You're talking about like uh, heavily degree burns all over. He's probably disfigured. Probably didn't have any hair. It was patchy. Um, probably pretty, pretty rough looking dude. Had been sequestered to an island by himself. And he's writing... Um, this, this book, Revelation, which is powerful, and, and, and God is allowing him to see certain things. Uh, John already has a history of being true and faithful in terms of what he records. Back then when people would write letters, if they wrote, if they, if they were incongruent with the truth, they would be discredited forever. To be a scribe, to be a writer of this type of communication was super important. John had that, in his, that history in the church of, of, of having integrity. Uh, John blesses us from the grave, right? Whoever, it says this, whoever reads this aloud and obeys it is blessed by God. Why? Because the time of reckoning is near. When God writes his word for his people to hear it is for purpose. It's not just to hear him talk. Everything that God says glorifies his name and has purpose. Everything, not one word, is wasted. Let's skip down to verse 5. Revelation 1, and I'll start in the second part of, of verse 5. Here's what he says. To him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him, Jesus, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Before the prophecy is the clarity of, of who Jesus is. So if you're asking right now, okay, Tom, I know I'm supposed to love my neighbor. I struggle with that because 
I don't know, maybe I'm not gifted in speaking or I'm nervous or I have some anxiety or whatever. Man, I get it. I get it. I, me, me too. All those things, honestly. I am an introvert by nature. I'm a practicing extrovert in my job, and I love to preach and I love to teach, but I would prefer to be at home by myself. Honestly, I love my house and I love my family, and everybody else is a little weird to me, okay? That's who I am. <laughs> but let me tell you something. This is huge. I understand fears of doing these things. That's why you and I, the church, we have to fill ourselves up with the radical truth of Christ because the more faith you have, and if you don't hear anything, listen to this, the less fear you have. It, they, don't, they don't go together. You can't say, I am filled with fear right now, Pastor Tom, but I have full faith in God. Mm, no, no. When fear and anxiety, and I get them, I have them too, are dominant, Faith is low. One kiss, it's like oil and water, right? What happens if you pour water into oil? It, they, they will not mix. They won't. And one will leave the container they're in. Okay? So what you and I have to do is to build like you're at the gym. We have to build this faith muscle. Uh, faith pleases God. In Spanish, fe agrada Dios. Faith pleases God. He wants you and me to step out in that, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Oh, and God is there. He wants you to build your faith. Church, do you believe that? Do you believe your faith is called to be built, not kept the same? Because when we keep it the same, what we're really doing is decreasing. That's what happens. And as faith decreases, questions increase. And as faith decreases, anxiety increases. And what if, and what if, and what if, and I don't know. And, and as adults, all of us over 30 or 40, wake up at that 1, 2, 3 a.m. hour and begin to heart start, oh, well, I don't know how we're going to pay these bills and what are we going to do with our kids in school. You know, it goes, it goes off the chart. I want you guys and I want me, I want my family to work very hard on increasing our faith because it pleases God and it puts to death anxiety. So how do we do that? We learn about him. We learn about Almighty God. We learn facts about who he is. We learn about his personality. We learn about what he does. We learn about how he cares for us. How right now, Dr. Elliot is in the presence of the living God. That when John the Baptist sent word to his cousin, like, are you the Savior? What Jesus said to tell him is, tell John that the blind are seeing and the lame are walking. But he did not say to John, and you're coming out. Okay, so God has a place and a plan for all of us. We need to, as the church, increase our knowledge of who he is because as we know who he is, our faith goes deeper as to what he can do and who he has been and who he shall be. So before the prophecy is the clarity of who Jesus is, let me remind you as a church who he is. Jesus loves his people. Now, come on, like, listen, you got to get this. Those of you all that have kids, how do you love your children? Mm, forever you die for them. Uh, how do you love your family? Just incredibly close, connected. Hanging out with, with your pastor and his wife and their awesome kids last night. They were playing games with my wife at a table. I recorded it in case anybody would like to bribe me for that. I saw it all. Just yelling, talking, loving each other. It was beautiful cacophony of joy to see a family respond that way and care for one another. Um, listen to me. and Look at me when I say it. Jesus loves you. He doesn't love you. He loves you. He loves you. He deeply, deeply loves you. That's a big deal. Because I was raised in a pretty legalistic church, which kind of said like this, there was an understood between the statement, well, Jesus loves you. And you need to stop speaking that way. Jesus loves you. You need to cut your hair. Jesus loves you. Why would you ever wear an earring? Jesus loves you. Don't act that way. Jesus loves you. If you do these things, then Jesus will love you. That is contrary to Scripture. It's contrary. That, it, that means it's a lie. What Scripture says is Jesus loves his people. He emotionally loves you. He physically loves you. He spiritually loves you forever. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 says he seals you. Tupperware, baby. He ain't letting you go. Second one, Jesus has set his people free. Free from what? Free from the fears that plague us. Free from the addictions we struggle with. 
And I'm not saying just if you trust in Jesus, everything is done. No, it's hard, man. Addictions are real. I've seen them all my life. I've had them myself. I get it. But the truth of the matter is, uh, Romans 6, he has set you free. Do you not know that you are slaves to what you obey? Either, Either obedience, which leads to righteousness, or sin, which leads to death. The chains are put on by ourselves and our fear and our addictions. Jesus has come to set us free from all that. It was through his shed blood, perfect sacrifice. We have to understand that there's no sin forgiven without shed blood. Some Christians, more liberal churches, will say, well, it's Christus Victor. It's like Jesus' power, and we look up to that, but we do this by ourselves. No, you don't. All have sinned. All fall short. None are righteous. No, not one. Not one of you chose Jesus. Jesus chose you because he loves you. He loves you like I love my 10-year-old, Mary. When we get home tomorrow, she's going to say, Daddy, and she's going to hug me. She's not going to be like, yeah, I'm glad you're home. I love you a little bit. <laughs> she runs to me, and she, she hits me, and my older daughters do too. And, and my wife and I will be excited about seeing them because we have a deep, passionate love for one another. This is how Jesus feels about you. Number four, he has built us a kingdom. The kingdom of God is for who? It's for the glory of God. And it's for his people. It's for Jesus' people, like me and you. Now, listen, I have a rough, 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 rough past. And um, I'm always surprised that I've been saved. I should be dead and I should be in jail. And I have not been a great husband and I've not been a good dad. I've not been a good brother. I've I've, I've done all the things that should have condemned me to hell. So it blows me away that God would, would save me. Any of us feel that way? Okay, listen, that's us, right? I'm seeing you. You're catching my eyes right now. You're one, you're, we get it, okay? Um, the truth of the matter is, though, that God is preparing a place for all his children, not just some. I used to think that if when I got to heaven and Jesus said, all right, Weaver, you're outside in a pup tent, I'd have been like, yes, I'm here. I made it in. That's all. I, I'm cool. I'll sleep in the grass. That will be fine. But the truth of the matter is that no matter where we come from and no matter what we've done, the redemption is so powerful through the blood of Christ that holiness is imputed to you, which means it's put upon you. It covers your sin. This is what Christ does, and he's he's prepared a kingdom for the people he loves. He's able to make us, number five, broken people, me and you, priests. What? Like, I don't feel like a priest? I feel like a dirty sinner. Sometimes when I meet with people in counseling, they will say things like, Pastor Tom, I just, you know, I'm just feeling like really dirty right now. And, and I'm, I'm really, you know, I feel dirty and bad. And I say to them, that's because you are. That's because you are. Like, let's not move past that. But because of Jesus, what he offers you is to have this perfect righteousness that he embodies, that just naturally flows from him, put upon us through his shed blood. The broken the liars, the dirty, the scoundrels, the angry, and worst of all, the self-righteous can come to Jesus and go, I got nothing, I need you. And his response to us is, man, I've loved you since before you were born. I love you so much. Thank you. Come here. And he makes us whole and he calls us to be priests, you know, the fellowship, the priesthood of the believer, to care for one another as I'm watching you guys do. This is our call. This is mine and your cause. And the sixth one is from this passage is all glory is his, all dominion is his. So you and I, as good things happen in our lives, we have to say, it's because of Jesus. It's because of Jesus. Listen, this is the one-on-one of loving your neighbors. It's that simple. When your neighbor asks you next week, hey, uh, how are you doing? What's going on? Man, by the glory of God, it's a wonderful life. Come on, I dare you to say it. 201 of that study is mentioning the name of Jesus. Because a lot of people in Vancouver will talk about God, right? There's a lot of spiritual people here. Uh, And some of the spirits they're worshiping are demons. That's what they are. We're worshiping a spirit that is God. They're worshiping created things. We're worshiping the creator. It's way different. The creator, the one that, that spoke and breathed and the universe came into being. Colossians says that Jesus is the one that holds us together on a subatomic level. It's called the God particle, scientists in the room. Verse 7, look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. So Wes and I know a lot of smart theologians 
And some of them will think way past us. Well, that means metaphor. It's not a metaphor right here. It means exactly what it says. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. And amen means so shall it be. So shall it be. This is the combination of Daniel 7.13, Zechariah 12.10. You can look those up later if you choose to. Um, This is my eschatology, okay? You ready to hear the summation of my eschatology? Study of end times. You You want to hear it? One day, Jesus is coming back. We'll see him. You're welcome. <laughs> That's it. And I'm positive of that because the word says it. Now, it's pre, post, ah, ah, post, pre, whatever. You know, you and Hal Lindsay, y'all can figure it out. I, I know this to be true, is that Jesus says clearly, every eye will see him. The second part of that verse is really interesting, even those who pierced him. So it means not only the living will see him, but the dead will see him as well too. Jesus will be seen by all. And, this, and the last part is this, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be. Even those of us that are saved, we will mourn. You know why? Because we're, 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 we're cognizant of his holiness and therefore our actions of unholiness, even though we're saved. We're going to see that a minute in John Jesus says this in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. The one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come, the Almighty. Jesus tells us he's the Alpha and Omega. First and last letters of the Greek alphabet, by the way. Um, Used in conjunction, they mean entirety. They mean wholeness. They mean completion. Like not a part, complete, whole, nothing left. He is the I am God, past, present, future. My father explained this to me when I was a kid. My dad was a pastor too. I swore up and down I would never be a pastor because I saw how he was treated in the local church. I'm like, no way am I ever going to be a pastor. And I have a a, a freight company. I I shipped to Canada a good deal. I met my beautiful wife. My wife said on our first date as I pulled up in my new SUV and my platinum cards, and I thought I was the cat's meow at dinner because she was already a believer. I thought I was. She said, well, what if God calls you into ministry one day? And my response, because I was trying to impress her, was, well, then of course I'll go. (laughs) But God needs me. I'm, you know, I'm the guy. Doesn't need me at all. He's the I am God. He's the most powerful. He's the most able. He's the most capable. If we don't praise him, what does scripture say? The rocks will cry out. If a a country, uh, you see this a lot in Europe right now, some in Latin America, the Latin America is getting set on fire again for Jesus. If a country dies spiritually, God will call his people from wherever he chooses to call his people. You cannot resist the Holy Spirit when he is coming for you. So I don't pray a lot for people to open their eyes that they may say Jesus. I pray that the Holy Spirit would love them the way they're called to be loved because he's undeniable. Do we deny him? Yes, we do. But man, when the Spirit grabs a hold of somebody. Let's push forward again to verse 17, and we'll, we'll, we'll do 17, 18, and 19. I'll give you some observations. I think that um, hopefully it's going to be some aha moments for some of you today. John is now responding in Revelations, and he says this. Now, take into account that John knew Jesus, right? He hung out with him for about three, three and a half years. He saw him. He was one of the inner circle. John is the one that Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, and he didn't have on a little loincloth, by the way. He was completely naked. Uh, Crucifixion was the most horrific death of the day. I think still to this day, it's horrific. Um, They were literally... Uh, asphyxiate themselves over time. On record, when Roman soldiers, some of the toughest soldiers there have ever been, were told that they were going to be crucified, they went into shock because they had seen how detrimental it was. And so our Savior is on the cross being completely shamed and humiliated and treated like trash and allowing it to happen. John is the one that he turns to and says, John, take care of my mom. Mom, take care of John. John's a big deal to Jesus. They know one another, and yet this is how John responds. When I saw him, and what was Jesus, what state was Jesus in? He was in this physical state that he is right now as we we stand here, but in a glorified state. It's kind of glory, baby. Like it was power was emanating from him, and glory was tangible, and 
John says this, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me, which is significant, and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. John has been taken up into heaven. He's getting a tour of God's house. Anyone interested in this? Uh, one day we will see it. Jesus appears and John falls on his face. He's terrified. Why? Now listen to me. Again, Wes, Pastor Wes and I know a lot of super educated dudes. And as some of their education is past their, their, their wisdom. They will say that a verse like this, when it says the fear of God, what it means, it means a healthy respect for God. Let me tell you something. It doesn't. What it means is an awesome, overwhelming, physical, visceral reaction to being in the presence of the perfect creator. And so if God were to manifest himself right now, none of us would be saying to him, I just want you to know, God, I have a healthy respect for you. I'm really glad that you're here and I worship you. No, you would join me in the floor with your face to the ground. You would be terrified. You would shake because you are in the presence of the one who is in control of all things. He has complete dominion. And it would terrify you. John was terrified and he knew him. Now, are all people's response to God's presence this type of fear? I would submit to you that it's not. And I'll show you in just a second. Now, why is it connected? Listen to what the writer says in Proverbs 8.13. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. The writer says, I hate arrogant pride, evil conduct, and perverse speech. Let's break that down a minute because there's a key here as to you and I learning how to fear God, right? Um, it's an action right here. We've been called to hate evil. Why? Because Jesus hates evil. We have been called to hate pride, bad conduct, and perverted speech because Jesus hates those things. Now, let's just be honest. We do our best, but we don't hate these things like Jesus does. He's, he's a whole different level. We hate these things as believers, as we have been justified through his shed blood and made new and our eyes are open and we're walking in this sanctified, changing place all the time. We hate these things, and yet sometimes we don't. Sometimes we entertain them. Sometimes we enjoy them. We invite them. That's the truth. That's who we are. But here's the bigger truth. Jesus never does. He never does. And so his holiness and power and beauty are magnified a million times greater even than what is happening in our lives, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians. So then, dear friends, since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the what? In the fear of God. There's a connector. See, John, as Jesus had saved him years ago, was working all his life to overcome this flesh thing that gets enamored with the world. Because his spirit, right, was enamored with Christ. Paul's the same way. If he, potentially, if he wrote Hebrews, he wrote over half the New Testament. Paul, what does he say? Uh, oh, what a wretch I am. Those are the things I want to do, I don't do. And those things I don't want to do, I do. I'm the chief of sinners. Some theologians believe he was speaking retrospectively. We know he was actually speaking present. And yet he loved Almighty God. This is us. He's in the presence of what he's striving to do, John, but failing. John's holiness at best falls short of the holiness of the living God. Okay, so I'll give you a super simple example of this. You guys play racquetball here? Is that a thing in Canada? Play racquetball? Okay. Um, I know you play hockey. I've never played hockey. I would die on the ice. But I do love the cold. I'm from Texas. I, I, I wore a coat this morning just so I look, wouldn't look weird. I love this weather. I'm so happy here. Love it. Okay, um, so I played racquetball in my 20s. I thought I was pretty good. All 23, 24-year-olds think they're good, right? We think we're amazing. And I was probably almost a B player, which is pretty high, probably up there. And um, I'm practicing my serve one day in the challenge court. It's all glass. And I see this guy on the outside of the racquetball court. And he's looking in, and he da 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 He taps the glass, and the guy says, you, you want a game? I'm like, yeah. And I looked at him, and I thought, yeah, he wants a game. I'm going to rip this guy up. He's, uh, he didn't like he'd ever lifted at all. 
He had like on a, a big, thick sweatband, which was not cool at that time. I know it is now. It was not then. His shorts were super high, 70s style, and he had on like high socks up to his knees. That was cool now. I know it is now, but it wasn't then in the 80s at all. And I thought, <clears throat> got this guy. So he came on in and he said, you want to serve first? Yeah, I serve. And he went, just hit the ball so hard it just came off the wall flat. That was the last time I served, by the way. He beat me 15-0, 15-0, 15-0. He just, he wasn't even sweating we were done. And, and he, he said, uh, he said um, thanks for the game because he couldn't have said good game because it wasn't a good game. It was a great game for him and it was horrible for me so it wouldn't have been a good game. So he said, thank you for playing me. And I'm like, yes, sir, thank you, thank you. I walked out and I went over to the juice bar and I'm just sitting there just being humbled by the Lord, which we know is not a bad thing at all. And the guy behind the juice bar was like, yeah, dude, he's like five-time world champion. Okay, then, I feel better now, okay? His level of play, mine is below the building, okay? So when John, who is trying to be holy, he wants to be holy. I know you want to be holy, too. If you're, if you're a Christian, if you really love Jesus, I know you desire to do the right thing. I know you do. And yet, the best holiness we have just pales in comparison with the holiness of the living God. And John's in that presence. I believe he drops to the ground out of physical fear, but also out of shame. I remember the story of Cain and Abel. Is this, there's a dichotomy here. See how um, Cain responds to God. Who Cain and his brother uh, Abel and their parents, Adam and Eve, they saw God, they heard him speak. All the time, Cain said to his brother, Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, this is Genesis 4, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him and murdered him. Then the Lord said to Cain, God speaking, the all-knowing God, the omnipresent God, the omniscient God, the all-powerful God, where's your brother Abel? How does Cain respond here? Does he have holy fear of God? His response is, I don't know. He lies to the one who knows. We're just as guilty of that, right? I mean, we lie. We, we lie. We lie to ourselves probably more than anything. I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's guardian? The gall of this guy. To say that, to lie, and then to say, why? What's it to you? Then God said, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed, alienated from the ground that opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. You have shed. There are people that do not respond to God with holy fear. They raise their fist at God. But what we studied at the beginning of our worship time today is one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is God, is Lord, is Savior, is Creator for the glory of His name. And some of those confessions will be, I believe, like, like apart from the Holy Spirit, Stephen Hawkins was right up to the time he died, like, there's no God. Second after he was dead, he realized there was. So some of the confessions will be, you are God, and I, and I never knew it. But some confessions will be, yes, you are. God, thank goodness you're God. Thank goodness you're Savior. Thank goodness you are who you say you are, Almighty God. And I pray that confessional for you. I pray that we, as we are filled up with the holiness and truth and the power of who God is, that we can't keep it in anymore. That it must be shared, it must be talked about. God seats Jesus at his right hand. Jesus extending the right hand was a sign of honor, dignity, and authority to John. A clarification of who Jesus was and a care for him. Jesus tells him to not be afraid. What do you think his voice sounds like? Have you thought about what does Jesus' voice sound like before? I don't think he speaks in the King James. I don't think he does. I don't think he says thou and shout, though he may. I don't know. Um... When I do a funeral of the saints and um, people that know Jesus and I do their funeral, I, there's always a little, like, I hope righteous jealousy in me, like, that brother, that sister, is, they, they've heard Jesus speak now. They've seen him. You ever thought about that? 
See, these are, the, the, listen, church, these are the things that build our faith muscles. A pondering of the better things. God, what does your voice sound like? I want to hear you. God, speak to me tonight in my dreams. Have you asked that? God, speak to me from your word today. Just your truth. Jump off the page. God, allow me to pray for somebody today. Maybe it's going to be at the checkout. And we're, We did uh, mission work for a long time on the border of Mexico and United States. Um, I went to a gym. We're some of the scariest dudes you've ever seen in your life. Big, giant, scary dudes. A lot of drug trade where I, where I come from. And so um, the drug dealers are religious, though. They have a respect for God. They have saints they pray to when they run their loads of drugs. And so they're all in our community. We knew many drug dealers, and, and I would start these relationships with these guys. And they knew in Texas that lawyers could not put me on the stand because we have what's called pastor privilege there, unless it was child sexual abuse, which I would go on the stand for. Through murder, they could not put me on the stand. Drug dealers know the law is better than the people who keep them, okay? So I would be in these conversations. They knew I was Pastor Tom, and I would be talking to Juan or Jaime, and he would say something about his family or his child, and I would say, Jaime, can I, can I pray for your, your son? And they'll say, yeah. So what we mean in church by that is, hey, I'll pray for you. See you later. Why, why, why do we do that? Why don't we pray now? And so I would say to Jaime, Jaime, can I, can I pray for your son? He's like, yeah. I said, can I pray for him right now? He's like, yeah. And so, dude, I would lay my hands on Jaime at the gym. Lord, I lift up Jaime. He is a large dude. <laughs> Bless him and keep him and watch over his son and heal his little boy in the name of your son Jesus who died for us on the cross and shed his blood for our sins. Amen. A lot of times they'd be in tears. What is keeping us as the church from loving our city? is anxiety and fear that is not founded in the truth of Jesus Christ. It's not founded there. What would his voice sound like? I wanted to read you a verse from Zephaniah 3.16, then we'll finish up verse 18 and be done. I hope I'm not over, but I'm leaving tomorrow, so you can't get upset at me. Zephaniah 3.17, The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness, he will be quiet in his love, which literally means he'll quiet you with his love. He will delight in you with what? With singing. Remember, God is present. You matter to him. He is the strongest warrior. Our Jesus, our older brother, our savior is the warrior poet. He invented, he invented song. He invented poetry for the glory of his name and our greater good. His love is calming. It doesn't make you nervous. My mother loves me in a way that is calming. My wife is half my size, but when she's out of town, I'm a little bit more restless. I feel safer when my small Latin wife is with me. One, because she's a little bit of a gangster, if I'm being honest with you. <laughs> but two, because she just she gives my heart peace, and I love her. She's my wife. She's part of me. This is the kind of love that, that, that the, the writer is talking about right now. His love doesn't make us nervous. His love calms us. Like we calm our children, right? It's okay. It's okay. Put them on our shoulder. Pat them. Then they burp and they go to bed, right? That's how it works. <laughs> His love is calming. It doesn't make you nervous. And one day we will hear Jesus sing over us. Come on, catch that. Like, grab a hold of that. It should be an aha moment for you. Like, wait a minute. Jesus, I feel like you're distant. I've never thought of you as a singer. Duh, he created it. He's got a voice. He's got a, a powerful voice. When he began to speak in the temple, in the New Testament, he spoke with authority and power that had not been heard for 400 years since the last prophet. He also sings with the voice of authority and power. And I've, I've found myself at night, Lord, I want to I want to hear you sing. He hasn't, he hasn't answered my request yet, but we know that he keeps all his promises, and right here in Scripture it says he'll do it. Okay? Verse 18, we're finishing up. And I am the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, because of this, he says to John, who was terrified just a second ago on the floor, he's put his right hand on him. He's raised him up. He's looked him in the eyes. Don't be afraid. I love you. I'm not going to leave you. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is and what will take place 
after this. So I'm going to finish up with Jesus' six things because I want the Holy Spirit through this powerful word and my, my weak communication to fill you up, fill you up. And may this be the week, church, that we begin to prove that we love God by loving our neighbor. Can't separate them. If you don't do one, you don't, you're, you're not the other. Jesus is Alpha and Omega before everything Jesus. Right now, Jesus. After everything is gone, Jesus. My father would explain it to me as a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. We love Calvin and Hobbes reading that growing up. He would say, do you see the square, son? Do you see the first one and the last one? I said, yes, sir. He said, we're outside of that story, aren't we? Yes, sir. This is how God is with us. He's not bound by today. God is not waiting and saying, I wonder what my people are going to do tomorrow. Gee, I hope they make the right decision. He already knows your decision. He is leading you in that decision. Do you have free will? Yes, in your sanctification, you do. How do those work together? I don't know. I'm going to take that class in heaven too. We'll figure it out together. It's okay for the body of Christ to say in some things, we're not sure about that one. It's okay to not be sure because Jesus is completely sure. He knows. Number two, Jesus is the one who is, was, and is to come outside of time space. Number three, almighty, which means Lord of everything, the all-encompassing supreme ruler forever. We have dictators that call themselves those during the years, which is silly because they're only dictator of their little faction or, or, their, or their country. Everything that we can see, imagine, Everything that we cannot see and imagine that is in existence, God is over these things. Number four, the living one. Jesus says, I was dead for you. Now I'm alive forever and ever. He's in bodily form right now. Number five, alive forever. Never again will death have any dominion over Jesus. And the truth of the matter is, it never had dominion over him because he chose it. He volunteered it. He wasn't murdered. They tried to murder him. Jesus decided, though, even before they stuck the spear in him, that he would go ahead and give his life up as a ransom for many, right? They wanted to murder him. They didn't because Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. One day when we're in heaven, who will be Lord of heaven, church? Jesus. One day, hell will be filled as well, too. Who is Lord of hell? Jesus. So some will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and and those that confess him now and receive him now and get filled up with the Spirit now, oh, Jesus, my Lord, my King, let us worship you. Let us sing to you. Why? Because the last part, Jesus says, I hold the keys to death in Hades, which means that he's the only one that can free us from the binding of sin. He's the only one that can do it. He's our only hope. So today, church... As we finish, let me, just, let me just beg you. Let me just exhort you. Let me just plead with you. This love that you say of God must be connected to the love you have of others. This city is dying. Your city is dying. My city is dying. Um, there's a phrase in, in uh, the prison life of the United States called dead man walking. And it's when somebody is about to be put to death capital punishment, when they walk from their cell, <clears throat> they're walking down the hall to wherever, what's about to happen, they will say, dead man walking. He's, he's already done. It's already been, listen, there's a lot of dead men and women walking right now. They may have a lot of stuff, but they don't understand that the second after this body is done, they, won't, they must confess that Jesus is Lord to the detriment of their eternity. Let's confess now. I, listen, I'm a believer. I've been a believer for about 17, 18 years now. I confess Jesus all the time. When my family, when we take all, to communion together, Jesus, we confess that you are the Christ right now. Romans 1, 17, we're not ashamed of the gospel. There has to be this killing of the anxiety. And if you have that anxiety, come talk to Pastor West. Come talk to some of your leaders here. Get into a community group. Uh, investigate discipleship and what that means to just learn and grow. I want all of your faith, and I want you to pray for mine, for my faith to increase so these weird little anxieties that we have that prey on us like gnats and flies are just eliminated. 
And the shalom of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is your witness. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I'll pray for us. Our Lord, thank you for your blessing of what you clearly, who you clearly are in Scripture. You're the Alpha and the Omega. You're the firstborn. Uh, you're, you're the perfect one. You were tempted in every way that we were tempted, Lord, and yet you chose not to sin. You chose to obey the Lord. You spent time in prayer. You studied Scripture. You, you preached Scripture. And you gave mercy and love and forgiveness away. And Jesus, we as a body, open our eyes that we might see. We're called to be like you. We're called to give mercy and love and forgiveness away. This is what's going to benefit our neighbors first. A merciful heart, not a judgmental spirit. A forgiving friendship, not one that holds on to grudges. This is what the world does. We're different because of you. Lord, I lift up Dunbar Heights. I pray for a rejuvenation of all these beautiful saints and who they are and how they love you. I've seen it clearly this morning. Lord, speak to our hearts as only you can. We, 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 tend, to, we tend to keep to ourselves. We don't share some things out of shame, out of guilt. John got it. That's why he was cowering in front of you. We get it, Lord. Open our, our, our mouths that we may share with each other for the glory of your name. We may cover each other in prayers. Pastor West led these folks to pray for people. Powerful ministry. They will know we are Christians by our agape love. And all these things we give you praise and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.